So it's bye bye Dartmoor and hola Mexico. Mexico City is the largest metropolis in the Western Hemisphere, home to over 20 million people, 6 million motor cars, and some of the worst pollution in the world. Not ideal for animals, then. But the very founding of this city was based on a unique Mexican wildlife encounter. Right, here we have something relevant to our story. It is a depiction of the birth of Mexico City. Now, what we've got here are the original Mexican tribe. As legend states, they saw an eagle catch a snake and settle on a cactus. And that, for them, was the symbol this was a place to settle. Nowadays, you'll be lucky to see any kind of wild cactus, snake, or eagle here in Mexico City. However, this was the moment that the fate of the axolotl was sealed. The city's first inhabitants weren't just into snakes and eagles. Like me, they were axolotl fans. Their city was built on islands in the middle of a series of lakes, swarming with axolotls, which they revered and ate. When the Spanish invaded in 1521, they drained these lakes and built their city on top. However, a few patches of the original lakes have survived to this day. Lake Xochimilco has 2,000 hectares of agricultural land threaded with 189 watery kilometers of canal. This is the axolotl's home, the only place on the planet where they live in the wild. So it can't be that hard to find them, can it? But the lake is squeezed on all sides by one of the planet's megacities, whose rocketing economy pumps 80 million tons of carbon into the atmosphere each year. In the 16th century, there were enough axolotls to feed the Spanish army. Today, they're amongst our most endangered amphibians. Well, we've just stumbled across this rather fab bit of graffiti, which uh, pretty much says we must protect uh, animals. We can all protect in the protection of animals in their native environments. We've got rhinos, we've got elephants, and we have got what should be an icon of conservation, the axolotl. That's my way of looking at the world. And as we'll see later, the axolotl inhabits a world of weirdness that puts it head and shoulders, not to mention regenerating limbs, above other conservation icons. Because its biology is so weird, it's studied in labs the world over. Well, if there's going to be a lab dedicated to axolotls, it was going to look like this in my dreams. Here at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México is a high-tech lab dedicated to studying what remains of its native habitat at Lake Xochimilco. Hola. Hola. This man is my ticket to axolotls. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Luis Zambrano is in charge of a team of crack researchers studying different aspects of the Xochimilco ecosystem. They aim to understand the conditions needed for axolotls to thrive in the wild. And to that end, they're also studying the creature itself in captivity. So these are all originated from, from wild stock here in the area? Yeah. I mean, this is the second or third generation of a colony, but we, start, they, we started with the wilds. So the big question for me is, when was the last time you actually saw a wild axolotl? Uh, last year? Last year? Yeah, last year. So they're still out there? There are still they, some there? There still some, some of them, but I mean, but they have been, the, the population has been declining a lot and really, really fast. So That's how many net casts did you think it, it took to catch one axolotl? Uh, we, we used about 550, something like that, cast nets through all Xochimilco. Okay. We used a professional fisherman that used to catch axolotl. But about the, the population is really, really ugly because in 1998 we made a calculation there was about 6,000 axolotls per kilometer square. Right. In 2004 we dropped to 1,000 per kilometer square oh. and we did it last year yeah. and we caught only one so it dropped from 1,000 to 100 per kilometer square. So it's pretty, the chances of finding anything is pretty slim. Yeah. The reality is we're going to do our best. We're going to try and find a wild axolotl but this could be the only definite axolotl you're going to see in this film. So I'm just preparing you for that. Um, I'm preparing myself for that. What's the ultimate goal for you guys? What, 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 is, your, what, what is your dream achievement? My dream achievement about axolotls will be to restore at least 
a significant part of Xochimilco in which these organisms can survive by themselves without any reintroduction or any type of colonies that have to be su supporting all these wild animals. I think that we can achieve that dream if, if we work together with the people from Xochimilco. And if we can work with them in this project, maybe we can achieve that dream in 10 years. Luis and his team are facing an uphill struggle to achieve their goal. And they don't fancy my chances of finding a wild axolotl in the next few days. But we're never shy of a challenge on this show. And there's only one place to start looking. Now, we've mentioned Lake Sashimilko constantly in association with the axolotl. And you might imagine a lake in the kind of regular sense of the word. Well, this is it. It isn't so much a lake, more a kind of a watery street map. Every single one of these lines is kind of a canal and they're all sort of interconnected. What we've got here is pretty much the market gardens that helped Mexico City flourish. So that is a really important historical context for this. But also, if you're an axolotl fiend, this is pretty much all that is left of its habitat. And every potential one of these little channels could be home to my axolotl. This is it. This is axolotl habitat. Lake Xochimilco is what remains of the pre-Hispanic city. It's a kind of Aztec Venice, a network of canals in between small plots of reclaimed land called Chinampas. It is the city's breadbasket, and it's all the remains of the axolotl's wild habitat. I've never seen anything like it. It's just phenomenal. Roberto here is our fisherman who's very understanding of, of what we're doing in the, in the axolotl survey and, and he's, a, he's using cast netting which is looks dead simple but it's actually one of the most complicated techniques. Xochimilco is still home to a handful of fishermen who used to catch axolotls for food. Roberto was taught how to fish by his grandfather and today he uses his skills to help the university with their surveys. He's giving me a lesson in the dark art of cast netting. And then swing it. Yeah and then again. Not a textbook cast, but it demonstrates the technique. What's happening now is the, the net's sinking underneath. The weights are hitting the bottom. And then leave it for a second, then we pull. And I'm assuming what happens now is that those nets close up. Roberto, you show me how to do it. To actually catch an axolotl, we'll need to play to our strengths. Which means Roberto will do the casting, and I'll just sit here and offer encouragement. That's how you do it. Fantastic. So we're off into the intricate web of Xochimilco in search of our axolotl. There's much more to this trip, however. Another boat of university scientists are busy studying every aspect of this unique and threatened ecosystem to try to understand what axolotls need to survive and what's killing them off. In fact, every living thing we find is another piece of the jigsaw. Right, I'd love to take credit for this, but yet again, I didn't. I just sat there and watched someone else catch it. Now, I don't know what species it is, but um, it is a natrix, or um, they get called water snakes. But in, in Europe, um, we have the grass snake, which is very closely related to this, and it shares many of the same features. One of which, which you're not appreciating right now, is the delicate bouquet, because it, it does absolutely stink. They have a musk gland um, right uh, in their cloaca, which is just horrible. I'm going to smell a snake for the rest of the day. But um, just like the grass snakes back home, this animal will... Um, it's a brilliant swimmer, so you'll see them swimming across the canals. They lay their eggs in decomposing uh, vegetation, so when the farmers here pull the weed out, and dump it on the uh, uh, on the land here in order to uh, to fertilise the soil. It forms these lovely warm piles of vegetation which incubate the snake's eggs. So it's perfect snake for this environment. I'm so pleased we found it. There he goes. Oh, I love the smell of a matrix first thing in the morning. Mm. On the surface, Xochimilco looks to be a healthy system, but it's a closed system, which means that once pollution from the city's wastewater gets in, it has nowhere to go. Another major source of contamination are agrochemicals used on the chinampas themselves. And the evidence the scientists are seeing and what we're turning up underwater points to an ecosystem in crisis. 
Now we're on about a 25th net cast this morning. It's quite slow going. We've got quite a few hundred more to go if we stand a chance of catching one. And this is pretty much what we've been putting up all morning. This really stinky, gooey mat of decomposing vegetation. And it's quite deep and it's quite soggy down there. Um, and it's not quite what I was expecting Axolotl Habat to be like. I was expecting a lot more lush vegetation. And we're not catching, well, we haven't seen any evidence of Axolotl. We haven't seen any evidence of, of pretty much anything, really. There's no, no, we've not found any crayfish or fish for that matter. Just 50 years ago, these channels were swarming with axolotls. But last year, it took nearly 600 net casts for the university survey team to turn up a single specimen. Master student Vicky was on hand when they caught it. Yeah, he was really healthy. He was, he was good. Yeah, usually uh, animals in, in the wild are healthier. They, they look like real savages. They are with huge gills and huge fingers and like their body really well shaped. They are a whole bunch of gorgeous axolotls. See, this is, you're my kind of girl. Listen to you describing an axolotl like that. That's great. This is the closest that I have got so far to where they live. This is where the last axolotl that this study has found was right here, right under this boat now. And on the spot of its last sighting, I'm starting to realise just how critical the situation is for this animal. This is definitely the biggest weird creatures challenge we've had in the sense of we could be here right on the cusp of extinction um, in the wild. I mean, it's happening all over the world with animals. We keep talking about animals disappearing and it's all down to our activities. But this is the closest I think I've ever been to actually witnessing an extinction. The loss of a species is a tragedy in itself, but it's also an indication of environmental collapse. And if searching Milko can't support its own wildlife, it won't be long before its resources are useless to people as well. Oh, we got a fish! We have a fish! Right at the... The water here can still support some life. So this is a little cup. But this cup isn't all good news. Its mouth is badly deformed. Oh, that's not good, is it? No, not at all. That's not genetic? No, that's not. So I'm, I'm, being, I'm being a pessimist again. Uh, so, OK, we, we've got a, a very, very sick-looking fish. So this is, the, this is part of the problem. This is, um, this is actually uh, an introduced species. This is the, the common carp. This is the fish we see, um, well, again, all around the world. It's been introduced all over the place. But not even them are having a nice time here in such a miracle in the last days. Really? Because if a carp's having a bad time, the water must be pretty disgusting. Cause... We are not only losing a an, an species that's pretty bad, but we are losing a whole ecosystem, and that's even worse. Lots of other species depend on this habitat, and we are losing it. So that's not a good scenario. An invasive species from Eurasia, the carp shouldn't be here at all. Its pollution resistance means that it can outcompete Xochimilco's native species, and it's another nail in the axolotl's coffin. Day one, no axolotls, but I'm beginning to develop my understanding of the Genampas. Here in Xochimilco, beneath the lush surface, the aquatic ecosystem is in tatters. If even carp, the underwater equivalent of a cockroach, is struggling, what hope is there for the vulnerable native axolotl? Before I embark on a second day's canal trawling, I've had a tip-off of a more urban location where salamanders have been spotted. I want to see if there's still a relationship between Mexico City's people and its axolotls. And this seems like a good place to start. This is uh, one, of the, uh, one of the markets in town. Apparently this is a good place to find the axolotl. The bit of the market I want to see is actually the animal department. That is apparently where I can find axolotl for sale. Um, however, it's also the bit which uh, people are more sensitive about. So I'm going to go in myself and ask some questions um, and report back as to what I, what I see, OK? Hola. We may have to turn the cameras off, for obvious reasons. Rattlesnake sperm, anyone? At this point, we did have to stop filming, as some of the market's activities fall slightly on the wrong side of the law. But while the crew filmed their lunch being made, I made an amazing discovery in the live animal section. Well, that's interesting. Um, 
kind of frustrated I couldn't show that. I'm kind of relieved I couldn't show you that as well because there's lots of things there that uh, nobody should ever see and, and uh, animals should never experience. However, um, what I've gained from that is that I have just held in my hand a jar containing three salamanders. One of them is most definitely an axolotl, the real deal. When you ask them what it is, why they want to uh, sell these things, it's, uh, it's as pets, of course. But uh, it's also been let out that they also buy them to, to cure cancer. Faith in these medicinal properties can be found elsewhere in the city. Voila. Wow. So does he have anything with uh, axolotl in? In this local pharmacy, axolotl extract is sold as a cough medicine and cure for all ills. Brilliant. Well, that's kind of, it's kind of reassuring. I, I know it's a strange thing for people to understand the idea of consuming the animal, but for me, this is reassuring that there is still a connection. And actually, sort of, I guess, rejuvenating that link between humans and axolotls isn't quite as hard to do as you might originally think. I mean, it's still there. The connection's there. What does this do? Axolotl folk remedies have been used for generations, and they may well be tapping into the axolotl's almost magical biology. It doesn't just look weird. This creature has practically supernatural powers. Before coming to Mexico, I took a trip to New York, to the American Museum of Natural History, to find out more about the axolotl's magic from herpetologist Dr. Daryl Frost. I guess one of the things that's given axolotls is kind of put them on a pedestal in some ways, both in, in folklore but also um, among biologists, is their ability to regenerate um, various lost parts of their body. Well, it's widespread in salamanders. I've seen it a couple of times. It's, it's uh, just remarkable. If, if uh, an arm or a leg gets lopped off of, of, of just about any salamander, they'll just regrow one. And uh, nice trick. I, I would think plenty of rugby players would, would, would like to have that ability. So, how does an axolotl regrow a limb? Take one axolotl leg. Go on, take it. There you go. Other animals would simply grow scar tissue to cover this wound. The axolotl, however, is able to de-differentiate its cells, making multi-purpose cells that are able to become all the different types of tissue needed to recreate the limb. As the limb regrows, new nerves and blood vessels reattach until you've got a brand spanking new leg. The mechanism is, uh, I'm sure you could get into some great detail at a molecular level, but basically you would initiate the de-differentiation of cells in the area like stem cells. It's almost going back to the embryo, when the embryo is... It is exactly growing. like going back to the embryo. Right. And it's just when you think this animal's weird enough to look at, but that, that is what really makes it. That's the magic of, it, of this, weird, this weird creature, isn't it? Well, it's the magic of salamanders. Because of these amazing powers, axolotls are proving key to stem cell research and thriving laboratories the world over. They may yet hold the promise of growing artificial organs and other fantastic medical developments that today only exist in the realms of science fiction. But back to today's axolotls in the wild. And at Xochimilco, you can see just how threatened the axolotl's last ecosystem really is. Over there, where it looks like a nice sort of romantic haze, you know it's not mist rising off the water. That has got a brown smear to it. That is actually the smog produced by Mexico City. Just to prove to you that this is bang smack in the middle of an urban area. And unfortunately, I've just realized that my dream amphibian, the axolotl, is swimming around in treated sewage water. Assuming, of course, it's swimming at all. Yesterday's agricultural idyll may have looked pristine, but it was masking the real problems beneath the surface. In contrast, where we're hunting today doesn't even feel clean. And all we've turned up this morning is another invasive, the sewage-loving African tilapia. Oh, my goodness me. Look at this netful. I mean, this is what... This is the kind of odds our axolotl's up against. A wild axolotl produces two to three hundred eggs once a year. These tilapia could put that away in a single city. So one of these fish could wipe out all breeding attempts of one animal if it wanted to. Or many more than one animal. Very aggressive, fast-growing, adaptable fish. It's been, again, like the carp, has been introduced to waterways all around the world and it's pretty much wreaking havoc there as well. 
But uh, just like the carp situation here, it's uh, a situation that's basically been amplified by the fact that these waterways are kind of compromised already. And it's a closed system, so these animals are just kind of making the most of what's left of this ecosystem, I guess. The two threats of this, yeah. of this place, actually. Face to face. Look at that. <laughs> You might be wondering why I'm so desperate to find an axolotl out here in the raw sewage when I can buy one in the market, pick one up in Lewis's lab, or just stay at home and look at the ones in my fish tank. It's a very good question, and one that's right at the heart of this weird creature's challenge. Captive versus wild. You know, what's the point of fighting a losing battle when, you know, we've got these things in fish tanks all around the world? Um, we've got them in zoos, we've got them in collections. If I was to give you another animal, just as an example, like the tiger, for example, do you think if I said, oh, forget them all in the wild, they're doomed, we've got plenty in the zoos, there'd be a massive outcry because we all love tigers. Tigers are very big, very sexy, very visual, very obvious creatures. So why is it any different for the axolotl? For me, it's not. There's an element of wildness about an animal in its, in its habitat. It is an animal in context. As soon as you take a, an axolotl out of its canal here in uh, Xochimilco and put it in a fish tank, you sort of lost something just in that simple process. These canals are the last piece of context the wild axolotl has left. Now, although what we've been seeing isn't exactly a pristine natural environment, it is, after all, the only chance the axolotl's got. But uh, it is rather nice and much more axolotl friendly than that. That there is Mexico City and this here is the frontier between the land of the axolotl and human urbanization and there's an awful lot of pressure for that to jump over this line and if that happens the battle's as good as lost. However down I'm feeling about the fate of the wild axolotl, our net has pulled in a slight glimmer of hope. It's another fish, and like the axolotl, it's a local. These little silver sides are a little bit of hope for us, because these delicate little fish are native. So, is that, is that how you see it? If you, if you find these, rather than tilapia, you know, you've got a reasonably good system? Or? Yeah, well, I, I mean, if we will have by far more of these, unless tilapia will be a very, very good system. Also, they can be the prey of axolotls, so the, also is the food of the, right. of the axolotls, so... So these little, yeah. these insignificant yeah. little fish, easy to miss in a net full of thrashing tilapia and carp, are a little bit of hope. This place was once synonymous with the axolotl, but on the way home, we get a glimpse of what today's lake is famous for. That is a prime specimen. This is uh, Friday night on the town, Mexico City style, although everyone gets out of the town and they come down to Xochimilca to uh, basically do this, party on a boat. It sums up the problem faced by all of Xochimilco's wildlife, the simple fact that it lives within one of the world's biggest cities. We've got uh, white pelicans, American pelicans over there, and we've got a, a, a floating party over here. And this is where those two worlds collide. I'm feeling a bit Crocodile Dundee right now. I feel a, bit, a little underdressed for the occasion. I need my uh, designer Japanese denim, or uh, certainly not my zip-offs anyway. The axolotl is a flagship species for the entire Xochimilco ecosystem. And if it's to have a future in the wild, the city will have to rethink its relationship to this precious natural resource. In a metropolis of 20 million people, any green space is at a premium. And at Xochimilco, the competing demands of people and wildlife are played out every weekend in a kind of aquatic party theme park. Xochimilco, the home of the axolotl, it's found nowhere else on Earth. And at the weekends, you begin to understand why the salamander's lifestyle is a little bit compromised by ours. This used to be Mexico City's breadbasket, a traditional canal and farming system that thrived in pre-Hispanic times. And while they are still farms, the majority have worked with modern techniques and chemicals and have all but destroyed this delicate aquatic ecosystem. 
But there are still a few local farmers, chilamperos, who understand that a sustainable future for the lake must draw on this past. So we've now headed to um, a part of the uh, Xochimilco uh, system, which is about as close as you're going to see to how things were I know, 500 years ago. Pedro Mendez is a chinampero who takes his inspiration from pre-Hispanic farming and is offered to show us his farm. These chinampas were originally formed by piling up material from the lake bed to make dry islands for planting on. And this same process still keeps them fertilized. So this is it. This is the, the action that created the landscape around here. Explaining why you're never far from water in this system. There we are. How easy could that be? Bag of fertilizer, just like that, without having to import anything. You haven't had to buy anything. You haven't had to drive it anywhere. You haven't had to go shopping. You literally dip your net into the mud and sludge and slurry and pour it onto the land. And that's it. That is the key to how this entire landscape goes. The water's never far away from any of, this, um, any of these crops because of that. The length of that net pole is pretty much what decides how far away your canals are from your traditional chinampas. And this is the water, the agriculture, the people, and the axolotl all come together in that, in the water. This really is key to everything. And this is why the axolotl has become not just probably one of the most important weird creatures for me, it's become a symbol of what weird creatures are to us all um, and how we all should interact with the soil and with the water around us and the environment. We are part of it, not above it. This is the definition of diversity. I've walked across, I've not walked far from the boat. I've seen about 15 crops already. I've seen sheep, I've seen flowers. We've got figs here, we've got... Most of the other chinampas we've seen have been growing a single crop, intensive and soil depleting farming. Pedro's polycropping is much more sustainable food production. He adds nothing but canal mud to his soil, so no nasty chemicals leach back into the water. Look at this. I've never seen such beautiful regimented herbs and vegetables in my life. Oh, it is, it, I, I'm going to say it again, it is beautiful. I guess if we're going to sum it up quickly, this is, is, is the antithesis to monoculture farming that we see everywhere else in the world. This is how man and nature, whether that be axolotls, whether it be barn owls, can coexist. And this is part of the project, is to try and encourage more people to go back to the old ways. Pregunta que si parte del proyecto es eso como motivar a más gente que se una y que... Es predicar con el ejemplo. Si ven que nosotros las... He says to, to preach with the example. And when people see this, then they start doing the same in their pieces of land. Well, hopefully this message will get across to just not just people that own the uh, chinampas, but uh, to market gardeners the world over, because I think this is absolutely stunning. Thank you very much, uh, much as gracias for showing us around. Brilliant, 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 brilliant stuff. I have to say, Pedro's chinampa has cheered me up a little and shown me that the future for the axolotl may well have to look back to the lake's eco-friendly pre-Hispanic past. But as I joined Xochimilco's weekend partygoers, I'm wondering whether the renewed interest in the environment here is too little too late, and whether the axolotl is destined to go the way of the Aztecs. And this peculiar mariachi blues jam. <laughs> While the party continues, I'm back with Roberto trawling more channels for the animal I'm still desperate to find. We're just trying everywhere, I think. Um, I've never been muting before with, uh, with marachi bands. I think it's all a bit... I, I can't... My head is, can't cope with this. It's just too... too... too surreal. But, uh, you know, this is as good a place as any. Otherwise, he wouldn't be looking here. I really, really want to see an axolotl. I want to prove... I want to believe there's a hope for the things. I want to believe they're still here. After four days of fruitless searching, it's hard to stay positive. I know, sometimes you think, well, you've got the best job in the world, and then other times you're bobbing around on, well, this water here is absolutely grim. It stinks, it really is. Not so much treated sewage as sewage. We're in a very built-up area. 
Look down in the water and everything is covered in this slick of slimy, amorphous grey. Objects you would otherwise recognise are covered in a skin of fur. It really is absolutely disgusting. And the best catch today, so far, is a sock. Size three. I mean, what are we thinking? We're uh, looking for an axolotl in effectively what amounts to an open sewer in someone's back garden. You wouldn't go looking for a giant panda in a Beijing car park, would you? It's kind of what we're doing. It's just as rare. Sochi Milko's revelers may know little of the animals slipping away beneath their boats, but their Aztec forebears held it in great esteem. They saw it as an embodiment of Xolotl, the god of deformities, and this association is inextricably linked to the axolotl's biological weirdness. Like many of its family, the mole salamanders, the axolotl exhibits neoteny, a kind of amphibian Peter Pan syndrome. Most amphibians lay their eggs in water. These develop into gill-bearing, water-dwelling larvae, like tadpoles, which in time metamorphose into terrestrial, lung-bearing, breeding adults. The axolotl, however, is a perpetual teenager, and it's achieved every teenager's dream of removing the need for grown-ups. A bit like me, it lives its whole life in a state of arrested development, retaining its gills and fully aquatic existence. Back to New York to find out more from Dr. Daryl Frost. If you're a mole salamander and you transform, it means you become air breathing. It means you're running around on the surface. And if, if outside of the pond or lake is, is too dry to survive as an adult, it's a bad thing to transform because it's a death sentence. And when there's no going back once you got to that stage. That's right. That bimodality to be able to be one or the other and, and optimize on the habitat is best to be in is, is a good thing. And it's, it's done well for, for the mole salamanders. Buried deep in their genetic code, axolotls still retain the ability to fully transform into adults. And this is where it gets really weird, because very occasionally, this actually happens. Back at Mexico City's zoo, I may have just found the weirdest, weird creature of all. This is like a private dinner with the Queen, where I'm allowed to play with her crown jewels. This is exactly it. I mean, look at this. This here is, in case you haven't gathered already, this is a freak of axolotl kind. This is an axolotl that has changed into an adult, a proper adult. It's lost its gills, it's changed its general body form, it's become more rounded, its tail fin has disappeared, it's developed bigger and better lungs. But this is so peculiar. I've only ever had, in 20 years, I've had one that changed and it died within a year. But this little chap here is five years old, which is incredibly rare. But I'm so excited to have met a genuine, wild-type axolotl that's metamorphosed here in Mexico City. This is probably the only time you'll ever see this on television, unless this guy goes on to star in his own movie, which he should do. Back to the hunt for my box standard weird creature. And at Lake Xochimilco, everything's gone a little bit sporty. Look at all this lycra, look at all these bikes, all these bicycle parts. This is our top secret axolotl location, would you believe it? Um, it's just at the weekend, on a Sunday morning, it turns into Mexico City's sporting central. It is, there's runners, there's cyclists. There's, um, it's just full of fit people running up and down. Just over there is the old 1968 um, Olympic rowing course. And that is where we're going to be looking for axolotls. Axolotling over there. <laughs> 1968 Olympic rowing course. We're here. It's not quite what I had in mind. Today, the tactics are different. It was Roberto's idea to try the rowing course. And here, instead of random casting, he says he's hunting the axolotls. He's watching for their distinctive rise pattern to show him where to throw the net. So it's all eyes on the water. He thought he saw one. 
Is he just a, a brilliant showman, or, or did he genuinely think there was an axolotl in there? This is the question. <laughs> I've got a good feeling. I have got a good feeling. There's definitely a different vibe this morning. Everyone seems to be much more excited. But suddenly, out of the murky green, the sight I've been praying for. Oh, axolotl. I just saw one. I just saw... I just saw an axolotl. <laughs> I definitely just saw an axolotl. Yeah, yeah. Just up and down, straight away. No doubt about it. Absolutely. Just definitely. Definitely, definitely. It's whether or not it's in the net. This is the question. I definitely just saw an axolotl rise. Uh, unmistakable. I mean, I saw it. I saw its tail. I saw its head. I saw it take the air. Just happened to be... I was... Uh, what's the word? Middle distancing. I was screen savoring. I was just blankly staring at the green, thinking, what is the hope? And then suddenly, bloop, right in the middle of my vision. Question is, did the net catch it? Oh, please, please, please let us, let that be in the net. Very muddy. You got it? You got one? Ahí está. Ahí está. Is it in there? Ahí está. Yes! <laughs> we have an axolotl. We have an axolotl, a real, live, wild <laughs> axolotl. Oh, man. How do we get it out? <laughs> I can't believe that. And obviously, it's my axolotl. I've spotted it. Wow. Oh, it's a big one as well. Oh, look at that. Oh, I would kiss you, but you're covered in... God knows what. It might be covered with filth, but it's love at first sight. I've got an axolotl, a wild axolotl. Look at the gills, it's absolutely astounding. Who would have thought it, eh? We have been trawling axolotl habitat, or what was once axolotl habitat, for days now looking for them in all sorts of places that looked much more likely than this ever would. And here we have it. Oh, look, <laughs> we, brought, <laughs> we brought a goldfish bowl with us. I'll pop it in there. Oh, my goodness me. Finally, we have got an axolotl. The relief that they're here. The relief for myself that I've actually seen one now seen one being pulled out of the water and the relief that there is with this net is a bit of hope it is a tiny 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 little bit of hope but it is hope nonetheless and we have to cling to hope for not just the axolotl's sake but our own we need the axolotl like the axolotl needs us 20 years I've been breeding these things, and every time I look at an axolotl, I wondered about where it lived in the wild. They live here in the 1968 Olympic rowing course. <laughs> the best net cast. And Vicky, the best pointing. <laughs> the, great, the best axolotl information one could have at hand. For two decades, this has been my weird creature, my favourite pet, my ultimate amphibian. And at last, I've got my hands on a real wild Mexican axolotl from Xochimilco, the heart of real axolotl country. But Vicky's about to burst my bubble. She's not convinced that the rowing course counts as a wild environment at all. I try to search it all over the whole ecosystem. This is not connected to the rest of the ecosystem. And as you point out, there's no agricultural lands here. So for me, it's like this is not exactly what's going on in the real thing in the 180 kilometers that are outside there. This is a pond, a, a, a fish tank. A fish tank, big fish. Well, that's a very, dip a very diplomatic answer. <laughs> Vicky's point is valid. This isn't a natural wild environment. But the axolotls don't know that, and they got here under their own steam. <laughs> Nobody put them here. Right. So, I mean, they were in the other part of the Xochimilco and they saw this area and they decided to invade this area and they have been performing really, really well in general terms. So I mean, they are survivors, basically. They survive in better conditions and they can survive in this really bad condition, which means, doesn't mean that, ah, okay, then forget it and then we can 
put everything to rubbish. No, I mean, we have to take care about them. I was going to say, even if it is a relic population that's 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 colonised here, in its own in its own under its own steam, yeah. it may be the only relic population left, judging by the figures that you've been getting in, in your studies of elsewhere in Xochimilco. So, this could be it. This this may not be natural, but this could be these two lanes that we can see, uh, however long they are, is could be the future of axolotls. So for me, this is wild enough. The fact that we pulled an adult healthy looking axolotl out of a, of a rowing course <laughs> is good enough for me. Whether it's a channel cut thousands of years ago or in 1968, it doesn't matter. This is as close as you can get to a wild axolotl. My baby will go back to the lab to help with Lewis's research before being released back where he was caught. The data he provides will be vital in understanding how axolotls fit in to the wider Xochimilco ecosystem. What I'm discovering on my axolotl pilgrimage is that the boundary between captive and wild is very blurred. On the final stop on my trip, it's about to get even more so. On a chinampa in the heart of Xochimilco, a local charity has bred an insurance colony of axolotls from wild stock. It's me. Look at that. <laughs> he just dipped the net in. It's a beautiful sight. I've never seen so many axolotls in one place. So we've seen a lot of axolotls in captivity, but these, um, in this one building, no bigger than a double garage, effectively represent, assuming this animal is going extinct in the wild, which is what it looks like, this could be the future of axolotls. This could be all that there is left. Now, um, it's a bit of a special day today because the whole team from uh, UNAM and um, Bonicio's gang are all together today because it's, it's a pretty exciting stage in the process. The whole point of this is to breed, uh, conserve the genetic stock and actually to breed healthy animals to put back into the wild. And today they're going to be releasing... 38 of these animals and the guys from you at the moment are just making sure they're all healthy um, last minute inspection kit inspection um, they're um, scanning them as well because they're all they're all chipped they've all got little pit tags in them uh, making sure they're all okay and ready to go and now we're going to be going out into the uh, uh, chinampa system and actually releasing some of these animals but I am, <laughs> it's a big day today, as you can see. I have never seen so many axolotl, this is probably the whole of Mexico's axolotl enthusiasts all in one place, as well as all the axolotls. So it is a big, big, big day. Don Nicho's team is working with local farmers and fishermen, the university and Mexico City's zoo to promote conservation of this habitat. The axolotl is their flagship species, and today they're releasing 38 of them into a wild sanctuary. One of the unfortunate situations when you've got an animal population that's this low in the wild is that, you know, humans have created the problem. Humans have to kind of put that right. That's part of our responsibility. So the, the wild captive debate suddenly becomes a bit blurred around this table because these are animals bred in captivity from wild stock going back to the wild sort of wild water though and that's the critical thing because the water here is is the key if the water is horrible then the axolotls won't survive the canals around this organic chinampa have been divided from the rest of the system with barriers to keep the axolotls in and their invasive threats out we're going to monitor them in this sort of semi-wild situation to see how they get on and then the next stage is to release them into the wild proper here it goes, here it goes, this is the first one. Don Nicho rightfully is releasing the first of the axolotls into the channel. There it goes. <laughs> this conservation project connects the axolotls, cultural, scientific and environmental significance to Mexico City and beyond. <laughs> It's a project that's not only critical for the survival of my weird creature, but also for the future of one of the most populous corners of our fragile planet, and for all the people who live here. I'm very, very excited. This is the first time I've been involved, so I feel so involved with an animal, um, and the first time I've been accepted as part of a, as part of a team. 108 007 273 is my axolotl. 
OK, off you go. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. I've had such a good time here. This is, like, the most important thing I think I've ever filmed uh, in my life. So I've been very... I feel, I've been made to feel very welcome. So, thank you very much, everyone. It's been a personal pilgrimage of 20 years that's brought me to this place, and it's not quite what I was expecting. Um, for, uh, for the most part, I could see nothing but lost hope filling the canals of Sochi Milko. Certainly, there was not a lot of hope for the axolotl. However, we can still pull wild axolotls from its murky green water. OK, and very, very few places. But the fact I've met fishermen, chinampa owners, farmers, conservationists, zookeepers and scientists all working together to preserve this animal and its cultural significance fills me with even more hope. This story, weirdly enough, isn't necessarily just about the weird creature, and it is a wonderfully weird creature, don't get me wrong, it's about the people. Because unless we can convince the 20 million or so people over there that it's worthwhile, then this will possibly be the last time anyone attempts to film them in the wild because they will not be here much longer.